All right, so thanks for coming into the workshop. So I, I realize that many of you have experience with um, doing microbiome studies already, and some of you don't. So uh, the way I sort of want to structure this is I'll, I'll give a very sort of basic overview uh, for those who have not much exposure to the, to the uh, field. But for those who have a lot of experience, I would like to encourage you to share your experience. So feel free to pipe up. I um, don't have that many slides, so there's time for discussion and talk about some problems or some um, issues that you might be facing or even some recommendations that you might be having. And um, throughout the workshop, it's uh, sort of not just learning from us, but also learning from each other and hopefully uh, you'll find someone who you can collaborate with in the future. Okay, so uh, there are seven uh, modules in this workshop. It's quite an intensive workshop. We go through the material fairly quickly, and there's different uh, areas that we're trying to cover, ranging from marker gene analysis to uh, metagenomic taxonomy analysis, uh, classifying and binning of sequence data, uh, and then metagenomic functional analysis where you would uh, do some functional prediction using metagenomic sequences and learn a bit about the databases and pathways that you can, uh, and pathway tools that you can use to, to do such analysis. And we also have uh, John who will be covering metatranscriptomics analysis. Uh, and on uh, sort of a, a guess the, the last module, would, uh, Fiona will talk a little bit about biomarker discovery. So this particular module, we're just going to define some of the terms, talk about some of the general approaches to the, doing these type of analyses, and uh, again, general discussion. So the general learning objective for the entire workshops are as follow. First, define the objectives of different types of metagenomics projects. Uh, process raw data files using appropriate quality control. So we'll talk a little bit about the importance of uh, quality filtering before you uh, proceed with your sequence analysis. And uh, we'll also show you some standard uh, pipelines that uh, we have developed in the past and we and others have developed in the past for marker gene analysis, for metagenomics analysis, and metatranscriptomics analysis. Uh, we'll also then uh, show you once you process your data how you could analyze the, the results, uh, some of the statistical approaches and network approaches for analyzing the results. And uh, also want the, the Field, as you know, it's an evolving field, so it's also important to recognize the technical limitations and uh, uh, and, and sort of and there are also conceptual limitations of metagenomic studies uh, that uh, will bring up during the workshop. Specific to module one. Uh, our hope is that by the end of this 45 minutes, you'll be able to know the key terms of in metagenomics. Uh, you'll be able to define the objective of metagenomics experiments and appropriate and choose the appropriate technology for uh, de designing your experiments. Uh, then, um, actually, uh, I took out the part about interpret the content of sequence file, uh, namely fast fast Q files, uh, but of course, during the tutorial, you'll have a chance to look at FASTQ files for those of you who have never dealt with a sequence file, which may uh, these days be like telling you know, airline passengers how to fasten their seatbelts. But in any case, we will show you what sequence files look like and how, uh, what, what the content of it is. And last bit is to, um, uh, in the uh, uh, hands-on tutorial, we'll show you how to acquire data from different online resources and reference databases available. Okay, so jumping right into the definition part. Um, so there's, uh, for those of you who are sort of new to the field, or even for those of you who are not sort of 
involved at the beginning of the, the field, there might be some confusions in sort of what's microbiome, what's, well, what's the difference between microbiome and microbiota, and what is metagenomics, uh, and what's marker gene study. So um, there's a bit of an interesting history uh, that's, list, that's uh, discussed by uh, Jonathan Eisen in uh, this link here. Sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, okay, this link here. Um, so microbiome is tributed to uh, Josh Litterberg by um, Laura Hooper and Jeff Gordon in their paper as the collective genome of our indigenous microbiome, what, what used to be called a microflora. But uh, nowadays, microflora, uh, given that pathogens, well, sorry, not path, uh, my, microbes, uh, Prokaryotes are not really flowers or, or plants. The, my, the term microflora is now sort of out of style. Um, and uh, the idea being that the comp uh, that microbiome described the comprehensive genetic uh, view of the Homo sapiens as a life form should also incorporate the, its uh, indigenous micro microbiome. Uh, so in this sense, the OM stands for genome. But there's actually a competing view uh, that uh, describe microbiome, the OM, as in biome, so as microbial biome or microbial community. So microbiota uh, describe the actual set of microorganisms found in a particular setting. Sometimes people actually interchange that with the term microbiome when the OM describes the, the biome rather than the, the genome. So, so there's, uh, not, so that sort of gives you an idea of why there's like people sometimes call it microbiome, sometimes calls it microbiota, but uh, maybe for clarif clarification's sake, you can use microbiota to describe the organism and microbiome to describe the genes uh, encoded by these organisms. That sort of resolves some of the ambiguities, but but again, there's no real standards. Meta. Sure. Yeah, so, so that's, that's a bit of a philosophical discussion in that people use marker genes to represent the, the organism, right? So uh, so that's why uh, that's why it's been used that that way. Okay. Is there any <coughs> consent? I would say you're getting a profile of the microbiota because you're using a technique okay. to try to profile the microbiota. <coughs> but and then I would usually say that you're describing the microbiome. So I tend to use microbiome as like the, the thing that you're looking at, sort of like in a general sense. And the microbiome really means organisms. And then 16S is just an approach to define that. Same with metagenomics, it's just an approach to sort of describe those things. Yeah, so the microbiota, uh, if you use it in, uh, in, in the sense of the set of organisms, I would also tend to agree with Morgan that's uh, well, the profile of the, the microbial community as, as a sort of accurate way of describing it. But if, again, if you use microbiome to, as the microbial biome, then you know you're, you, then people can also accept that as a as a term. I wouldn't really worry about it because people use it really interchangeably. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to teach best practices. Here, but... So it's just we have an endless discussion about how organisms. One person will change your entire paper to this camera, and the next person will say they can't do that. And then they're just like, no, I think you can. Yeah. Yeah, Morgan's more practical than I am, but uh, <laughs> but uh, safe to say is that maybe you just define the terms like I did here, and then you use it uh, to be to disambiguate what you meant. Um, but what the the important distinction here maybe it's not so much microbiome and microbiota, but it's metagenome and microbiome. Uh, so metagenome is actually a term that came about uh, later in '98 by um, Joe Handelsman. Uh, when um, she described it as 
advances in uh, molecular biology and eukaryotic genome, which have laid the groundwork for cloning and functional analysis of the collective genomes of soil microbiome, uh, microflora. So you can see here microflora at that time is still used, which we term metagenome of the soil. So metagenome in this sense here is that the meta is actually means beyond. So it's uh, it's their attempt to say we're now going beyond just looking at individual genomes. We're looking at the collective genomes of a community. So that's what the term metagenomics came about. Um, but it does not encompassing marker gene uh, surveys, uh, which you'll see way predates these type of uh, metagenomics analysis. So, so the important distinction here and the community sort of agree that it, the best practice here is not to use metagenome when you're just doing marker gene surveys, but to refer it to as marker gene analysis or 16S analysis. Uh, uh, and there's earlier um, in when the when the metagenomics uh, uh, when the human metagenomic was was being conceived, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, National uh, National Science Council I think uh, puts out this little booklet, the New Science of of Metagenomics. I don't know if any of you have seen a copy of this and. I, when I started in uh, um, my PhD, I actually received a physical copy of it, but nowadays I think you can still find a PDF of it. Uh, so the, the big picture of what we're doing here and why you're you know, taking this workshop or why we're doing metagenomics analysis is really to explore the relationship between microbiome and their habitats. This include their, uh, including the host environment, including natural environments. Uh, but uh, the important here, importance here is uh, to be able to interpret the microbiome, microbiome, the microbial community, in relationship to the environment and or the habitat. Uh, and to accomplish this, we use a series of experiments and computational tools to infer. The relationship, um, and and these tools, of course, including marker genes based analysis, metagenome analysis, metatranscriptomic analysis, uh, metaproteomics, uh, metabolomic, which is uh, uh, analysis of uh, the metabolites from a system, and some people even come up with the term culturum, which goes back to trying to culture individual organisms, but using uh, much more systematic ways of defining the, the culturing media to try to uh, culture more organisms. And culturing, of course, m most microbiologists know, uh, is a problem. And there's a paper that talks about the great plate count anomaly, uh, conclusion being that less than 1% of the organism across many habitats are culturable and the rest, while you can observe them indirectly, they never grow in the lab. Um, again, with the cultural type of approach, uh, this is gradually being uh, been tackled and it's probably not true for habitats that, uh, that are much more well defined, such as the, the human gut or the human body sites. Um, and the, the numbers, I think, range from 10 to 15 percent of the organism can be cultured from fairly well-defined sites. Um, but in any event, it's still nearly impossible to, to culture all the constitutions of a, micro, uh, of a microbiome. And therefore, we need a way of interrogating the, the community without culturing. So metagenomics uh, offers an effective uh, if imperfect ways of profiling the structure and the functions of a microbial community. So metagenomics and re, um, uh, marker gene based analysis really goes hand in hand with the development of molecular bi uh, biology, specifically with DNA sequencing technology. These are the, the fundamental units of analysis, if you will. So you, you need to sequence the, the genes and, and interpret uh, the functions uh, of the genes based on the sequence data. And in a way, what we're trying to teach in this workshop is how to do sequence analysis properly. 
and uh, there's a, a large number of sequencing platforms available. Some of them are more popular than others. Some of them are on, on their way out. And it's, again, a fairly actively developing uh, field that um, uh, demands attention, um, perhaps not in, in this particular lecture, but certainly um, worth while discussing when, if you encounter any questions. And the, but I'm sure many of you have seen this graph, the huge le leap in the output of sequencing platforms. Uh, I think this scale shows here a, a 10 to the 12 fold increase in, in less than 10 years uh, in, sequen in sequencing output. So this is a sequencing output per uh, instrument run. Uh, is really what's driving the, the data deluge that we're getting and the need uh, to develop fast and accurate bioinformatic algorithms to analyze the data. Okay, so the human microbiome project uh, started in the mid uh, 2000s and it stemmed from the realization that uh, after the human genome project, uh, the scientists wanted to tackle a, a you know a bigger question, and uh, what's bigger than you know the Human Genome Project, which can, which gave us a catalog of about uh, twenty five to thirty thousand uh, genes, and of course the, the splice variants and the transcripts, uh, is the, the the microbiome, the human gut microbiome. Um, it's estimated that collectively. Uh, the human microbiome consists of two to three million genes. Um, and in a typical person, uh, we have greater than a hundred, uh, greater than a hundred uh, species, depending on how you define species. And of course, much higher number of um, uh, strains in, in, the, in the human gut. And that's just at any given time, the, the system is highly, uh, um, uh, fluctuates uh, quite a lot. Okay, uh, any questions so far? It's just sort of very, sort of maybe even redundant introduction to what you already know, but uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to pipe up. Uh, so uh, next I'm going to go into a little bit of the history of how metagenomics and, and the, oh, sure. So I'm not an expert in that field, and from what I've seen, I think lots of studies are done using fecal samples and extracting metabolites. But also, there's um, I don't know if anyone else have comments on the meta <coughs> belomic studies. So sometimes most people just do urine right, to get metabolites, but that's about to be a lot of studies in yeah. some microbial organs. But then people doing on stool are more doing. Yeah, and, and metabolomic studies, from what I've seen, also typically tend to be much more targeted of the metabolites that are being analyzed. So it's varies quite a bit system to to system. Any other questions? Um, okay, so the story of how we come to doing metagenomics nowadays really starts in the 70s, and that's the, the era of molecular, uh, molecular biology. So in the 70s, a lot, uh, several important um, technologies were developed, including uh, sequencing technologies um, of, uh, of DNA, and it's been, it, it improved quite a bit. And uh, also, the, arguably, the first bioinformatics software package, the Statin package, uh, which to this day still can be downloaded and used, uh, was uh, released by um, uh, um, it was released in 1979. And uh, at that time, also again, um, 
molecular data are becoming available, both protein sequences or amino acid sequences and and uh, nucleotide sequences. So there's also uh, works done to try to uh, put the, the sequence sequences into the framework into the evolution framework. So um, matrix of how uh, how evolution of sequences occurred uh, uh, at that time as well. Okay, and this uh, statement pulled from the, the Staten Package paper published in 97, it's actually very interesting. And uh, it says, the continuing rapid fall of the cost of computer components is making it possible for most DNA sequence laboratories to have their own small computer. The fact that DNA sequencing is now a fast procedure and the availability of computers gives the possibility of more efficient overall strategies for sequencing uh, determination. And so it's it's actually interesting historic perspective that you know that uh, dideoxy uh, nucleotide sequencing, which takes days to do, uh, at that time considered state of the art and was considered a fast procedure compared to some of the, the earlier uh, technologies. And uh, I bet uh, when Staten wrote this statement, he wasn't thinking about the next gen sequencing uh, sequencing. Uh, are available today and how much faster it, we can do sequencing and I bet if you make the same statement today you know uh, 20 years or even 10 years later that's uh, uh, commenting on how fast sequencing is today uh, that statement will probably be, be uh, uh, in a way laughable you know 10 20 years from now as the technology is being improving um, and of course not uh, that's just uh, about sequencing technology, the computer components also have been reduced significantly since the, the 70s and 80s. Okay, so this is just to show that uh, uh, painstakingly um, a few small viral <laughs> genomes, a few uh, KBs long were published uh, in the 70s by manual sequencing. And we still do this today, of course. Uh, so, I mean, do publish genomes today, but it's just at a much larger scale and much uh, faster pace, and maybe actually low, uh, slightly lower quality than the initial genomes. So, in the eighties, uh, this is really the uh, the beginning of now. We have sequencing technology. What can we do with it? So, uh, Norm Pace's lab in Colorado in the mid '80s started to look at marker genes in a fairly simple communities, such as the uh, Hospital community, where there's most likely only, uh, at that time, believed only a handful of organisms, uh, microbial organisms, in such a, a community. So, in '95, uh, for example, the Octopus uh, Spring uh, uh, study, uh, the lab looked at uh, it's, they effectively took a sample from the, uh, the hot spring by putting a sponge in the hot spring, take it out, rinse it off, uh, and collected the um, RNA, the total RNAs from the sample, and then run it on a gel, cut out the band that correspond to the 5S uh, uh, RNA. And then you have to remember uh, PCR was not invented until uh, well, actually, it was not really published or invented until the, the mid-80s as well. So at that time, they actually have no way of amplifying a specific fragment. So they had to um, find uh, chemical me uh, methodologies to, to identify uh, ribosomal RNAs and then sequence ribosomal RNAs. So that's sort of a very painstaking uh, process back then. Um, and so this is just to show the three uh, sequences that they uh, isolated from the community. Uh, they just name it one, two, three, and, and compare it to some of the known uh, RNA sequences uh, available. And uh, they also published a, a simple uh, a tree of the known sequences at that time uh, in this paper. So it's quite an interesting paper to sort of give you some historic perspective. Um, in the late 80s, uh, NCBI was, found, uh, was founded and ribosomal database project, the, the RDB project, was also funded uh, back then and still exists, still function to date. 
although taking on quite a different challenge of managing large amount of ribosomal RNAs, most of them from unknown organisms uh, to date. So in the 90s, uh, sequencing technology continued to improve. We have capillary sequence, sequencers now that can be run automatically. Um, and uh, so in the in early 90s, uh, six, uh, PCR was used to clone, uh, uh, to clone 16S sequences and, and uh, sorry, to clone 16S genes and then sequenced 16S genes and uh, gradually became sort of the, the, the de facto um, uh, marker genes uh, for, uh, for microbial community-based study. Uh, so the 90s is really defined as a genomics era where the first microbial genomes, uh, the bacterial genome was published in 95 and uh, in 98, uh, at that time probably only less than 100 genomes were, uh, or actually le probably less than 20 genomes were available at that time. Uh, Joe Handelsman is already thinking about going beyond uh, genomic sequencing and the term of metagenomics was coined at that time. Uh, again, she was trying to look at the functional aspect of a soil community. Okay, so uh, 90A Illumina was uh, founded and uh, next-gen sequencing technologies were uh, being developed and, and improved uh, during this period, uh, late 90s to early 2000s. Uh, the ERISA project, which is sequencing uh, intergenic uh, ribosomal inter, uh, intergenic spacer regions of ribosomal genes was also uh, conceived. Uh, it's an alternative to looking at uh, 16S and other ribosomal genes as a marker gene. It's very used, uh, these interspacer regions, of course, evolve faster than functional genes, so it's very useful for differentiating very closely related. Uh, organisms and some of the fungal organisms fall into this category where their 16S genes have very little variation but their interspacer um, sequences have much more variation. Okay, so in uh, 2000 uh, there's an interesting paper that uh, showcased uh, direct uh, cloning and, and identification of a functional, a new uh, type of uh, rhodopsin uh, called a proteorhodopsin because it's isolated from a, a bacterial organism. Um, and this uh, show you that you can actually go from sequence, uh, in take a, a, a DNA back into the lab and identify new functions uh, as opposed to observing the phenomenon uh, or the phenotype first and then uh, and then look for the sequences. Uh, in the early 2000s, the uh, micro, uh, term microbiome starting to become popular. And um, uh, at that time, again, none of the next-gen sequencers um, were available on the market yet. So uh, in the early 2000s, while some of the metagenomic studies were uh, when some of the metagenomic, early metagenomic studies were performed, these were done uh, on using uh, Sanger sequencing uh, to, uh, um, at a, you know, at a cost that's hard, that's uh, quite a bit higher than today and hard to imagine. And of course, uh, uh, some of the popular ones, including SMI drainage uh, paper, look at much simpler communities uh, and uh, the, the, when the paper came out, people were really surprised you can uh, shotgun sequencing a community and assemble uh, uh, the genome of an of a <coughs> organism in that community to almost completion, um, and that was sort of the novelty of, of these papers. Uh, so Jeff Gordon's lab in uh, Univer um, Washington University in, in St. Louis uh, started to look at uh, the interactions of gut microbiome and and the host. So a series of studies looking at uh, lean and obese twins um, were conceived at that time. Um, and they have access to a, a cohort of twins that have been tracked for longitudinally for over 20, 30 years. Um, and uh, they were able to essentially give sam uh, get samples from these twin uh, pairs and then sequence the 
the micro uh, sequence the, the, at that time 16S uh, marker genes from, from these individuals. Um, so in 2005, the 454, the first uh, next-gen sequencing platform was, was made available commercially. And uh, soon after that, uh, Craig Venter used it for the ocean, uh, global ocean sampling survey where he uh, essentially got on his yacht and toured around the uh, different parts of the ocean and sampled. Um, and I don't know, like, there, that's that, that data set is available but I think a lot of people found it to be heavily contaminated, and um, and the, but it shows an early effort to sequence the, the environment and to get a global perspective of how our mic how the microbiomes uh, in these environments uh, differ. Okay, so 2008, the Human Microbiome Project was was funded, and uh, the project effectively looking at both healthy and diseased uh, individuals to try to get a better understanding of, of uh, the human microbiome of uh, multiple body sites. Uh, and just add, while we're not going to look at the uh, mother directly in this workshop, uh, it's worth mentioning that in at the end of 2000, uh, the software package mother was first published uh, from uh, uh, patch loss, and I think, uh, well, Pat was from uh, Joe Handelsman's lab, so there's definitely a, quite a, a connection or, or a sort of a synergy between the bioinformatic development and the, the laboratory development. So uh, in early 2000s, uh, Illumina also became available, and by uh, 2010, uh, it's now the, the dominant sequencing uh, platform with the, the highest uh, throughput being the, uh, some of these uh, high seq machines. So with a large amount of data being able to generate with relatively small uh, amount of money, and now people are starting, really starting to look at sampling uh, globally. So the Earth Microbiome Project was conceived, uh, and during that time, Chime, which has, uh, which we'll talk about in this workshop, uh, was also formally published. But of course, Chime has been in use by the community uh, for quite a few years uh, already. At that uh, by by that time. Okay, so. Uh, then comes the, the desktop sequencing phase that started to put uh, desktop sequencers in medium to small size labs uh, to make sequencing available uh, to all of you guys, really. So um, the uh, so really the 2010, the, the decade that we're in now is marked by microbiomes of everything. So people conceive different sites to be, uh, to be sampled. Uh, there's you know a whole list here, but uh, uh, recently we're starting to see actually citizen sci scientists getting interested into the in, in microbiome as well. So the American Gut uh, project uh, was started in 2013 to try to find a better way to to uh, characterize uh, the microbiome of um, diabetic patients. Uh, well, the technology in Oxford Nanopore was uh, released uh, li was limited release uh, in 2014, and so people started to, to test out so-called third-generation sequencing platforms. Uh, and in uh, last year, there's a, a Kickstart campaign that um, started by uh, Jennifer Gardy here and by um, Gen, uh, Gen uh, what's uh, Anyway, so by another researcher in California, last name Gens, uh, to essentially crowdfund uh, sequencing of your cats. So you can send in a sample of, of your uh, cat uh, uh, poop and, 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 of course, the, the money, and then they will sequence the, you, uh, they will characterize the gut microbiome of, of your cat for you. Okay, so that's sort of a, a intro. Uh, 
brief introduction of all the diff uh, different pieces of uh, scientific history that contribute to uh, the, the development of, of the, the field. Okay, so before I get go on to the next, any questions or comments? Do people want to talk about their favorite uh, sampling project? Is Uh, I think they're trying to understand some certain uh, fe uh, feline diseases and, and the microbiome. There's a, the website actually tells you sort of the rationales for doing it, and the people behind it are a true scientists. So they're not this, including people like Jonathan Ice and uh, Jack Gilbert. Uh, so they are people who are publishing uh, real metagenomic studies, and not not just someone you know. In, you know, in their own cabin, trying to get money from sequencing uh, cats. There is a dog microbiome. Yeah. So the the dog microbi dog microbiome has been characterized. So th I believe they're only looking at marker genes, so which probably exclude uh, or preclude uh, the identification of uh, parasites, unless they're looking at you know 18s uh, sequences. So so my guess is no, they're just looking at bacterial prokaryotic sequences. Okay, so there's Yeah, don't don't expect that project to diagnose your cat's uh, ailment for you. It's yeah, not at that point yet. I know uh, vet bills are expensive, but <laughs> any other questions or comments? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Any other scientific tidbits people would like to share? Okay, if you think of something, feel free to, to pipe up. Okay, so this is really just one slide per own type of... Uh, of uh, uh, coverage for the different uh, analysis pipelines, which of course we'll get into in a lot more details in the next few days. So the, the big picture analysis pipeline really is you collect the microbial sample, uh, you generate the, the sequence data, the meta, well, not necessarily sequence data, but the omics data, um, and you uh, run some pipelines to, including QC and, and including uh, um, uh, binning of your sequences and so on and so forth, and then follow up with some statistical analysis that hopefully give you some new insights of the the microbial community and the interactions that it has with with the host. Um, and so that's sort of the the ten thousand feet view of of the the workflow. Uh, of course, the the details it's a lot harder, and the, the and that's why why you're here, but also. Uh, it's, a lot of the details are still being being worked out and still being improved. So for marker gene analysis, which we'll talk about uh, today, uh, the the process are as follow: uh, you extract the, the RNA, uh, the the DNAs first. So when we talk about sequencing uh, ribosomal RNAs, we're actually sequencing the gene version of the the, the RNA rather than the expressed uh, product. So usually you track the DNA rather than the RNA. You amplify with uh, target primers, looking at specific regions of the of the mark of the genome, and we'll talk about uh, because NGS platforms are short reads and typically doesn't cover the entire marker gene. So these targeted primers also usually target specific regions of a gene rather than the entire gene for sequencing. 
uh, with the idea that you will be able to get a, a, a contiguous fragment for your uh, sequence for your for your analysis rather than having to assemble the the target uh, region. Uh, and then there's uh, sequencing platforms contain errors, so you need to fill out filter out the errors, build the clusters, uh, which we'll talk about in depth uh, later on. And then from once you have your so-called OTUs, then you can do your um, diversity analysis. For metagenomics analysis, of course, you also have to extract the DNA uh, sequenced random fragments uh, instead of targeted fragments. Again, QC uh, and annotation of the of the sequence. But in this case, because uh, the fragments are randomly sheared, you have the option of trying to assemble these uh, staggered fragments. And uh, after you get your sequences, again, uh, the, you can carry out function, uh, you can carry out taxonomic uh, analysis to look at the diversity of the community. You can then, you can also uh, carry out uh, functional, uh, try to predict the functions of the, the community. And this is uh, what Morgan will cover uh, tomorrow. So the metatranscriptomic studies uh, look at extracting RNAs rather than uh, than DNAs. And of course, there's ribosomal RNAs. A majority of your RNAs uh, is probably ribosomal RNA. So uh, you first have to subtract out the, the ribosomal RNAs, uh, reverse transcribe it, sequence the, the cDNA. Again, QC is an important step. Uh, and then you can uh, carry out analysis uh, looking at gene expressions and functions. And, and John uh, will cover transcriptomic studies on uh, Friday. Okay, so uh, I'll just quickly go over some of the major concerns in metagenomics analysis. And uh, if you have any additional uh, concerns, uh, do bring it up now. And so people, I might have missed something, so people can be aware of addition, other issues. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so clustering is actually not looking at context in that you don't put fragments together into a single context. Uh, clustering is actually just grouping uh, reads into a set of, of reads. And, uh, and also typical marker gene analysis that you'll see uh, have a defined star and end site that's bound by the primers. So typically you, you don't need to assemble. You just need to essentially collapse the ones that are uh, similar or identical to each other. Does that make sense? Assembly. Whereas assembly, because you're doing shotgun sequencing, the fragments are uh, from random uh, locations, you're trying to find overlapping fragments and you uh, assemble them together into longer fragments. And the key reason for doing that is usually longer fragments give you more information about the function of, of that gene than, than the 200 base pair or 250 base pair fragment. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sure. Okay, so so um, assembly, uh, you're trying to form contigs, right? But scaffolding, what you're doing then is to look at, um, so let me backtrack a bit. So doing sequencing, you have the option of doing uh, pair then sequencing or may pair sequencing where you know the two reads are from the same fragment of DNA but there's some gap there could be some gaps in between your two ends of two two ends right reads from the two ends so uh, what scaffolding the uh, is supposed to do is take these uh, pair end information or, or may pair information and uh, Put and, and try to order your context. Uh, that's so it's easier to draw it out. Or uh, I don't, do do people? Uh, everyone else interested in the in the in in what scaffolding sure. means? Okay. All right. So let's say that's your uh, 
your chromosome. And then these are your Right, so shotgun sequencing, you have random overlapping fragments. So these are the DNA fragments. Can everyone see that? Okay, so the DNA fragments some, uh, could be longer than your reads, right? So when you do sequencing, you could only you could be only capturing the ends of a DNA fragment. So these are your reads. So you have uh, reads like that. Okay, so let's see what's a good example. So that would be like pair and marker. So this would be called pair and reads. And mate pair is a little bit different. Mate pair, instead of sequencing in, you sequence out and and so, the, so effectively, the orientation of your your of your ends are, are different, and and so as long as your software know the orientation of the end, it will be the assembly will be able to put back the, the sequence. So scaffolding, uh, you have a good example. Actually, I need to change the graph a bit. Maybe not. Okay, so scaffolding means. Actually, let me draw a few more reads. Uh, so if, you have, if I have overlapping reads, let's say in this region, I, the assembler can put back the entire region by finding the overlapping reads, and this will be called a contic. But you notice there's a region here that, is, that has some gaps in it, but the region is spanned by a DNA fragment that uh, was not sequenced to completion. There's a gap in it. But, uh, but from the end, so for example, if I know that um, this uh, end and that end come from the same piece of DNA, then I could scaffold this particular, uh, um, let's say you have a so okay, so you have a contact here, contact one, and then let's say this region you also have coverage, so you have contact two here. Okay, but there's a but uh, these two, of course, when when the assembler gave you back the results, you would just report them as two separate sequences, right? Without uh, and you don't know the order of these two sequences in the genome. But because of the main pair information or the so-called locational information that you have, telling you that this particular fragment, uh, this particular read, and this particular read came from the same piece of DNA, and this read and this read overlap, then you now know that these two contexts are in this particular order, even though this region here has not actually been sequenced. So usually the um, Scaffolders will give you a bunch of ends where the, the region that's not been sequenced is, but the order of the context can be established based on the, mate, the, the locational information of your uh, mate pairs. Is that clear? Okay. So that's called scaffolding, and this is called uh, assembly or context generation. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay. Okay, so the first issue uh, that I've already alluded to is uh, the, the sequence data uh, quality issue. So sequence uh, sequencing errors exist, and the next-gen machines typically have a 0.1 to 0.01% uh, substitution error in the reads that, that uh, they generate. The third generation machines have much higher error rate. Uh, PacBio, for example, about 10% right now. And uh, uh, Nanopore, it's about 15 to 20% uh, error rate. So one in 10, one in five uh, sequence in, uh, uh, sorry, base in your read uh, could, could be erroneous. And this, of course, 
uh, affects your taxonomic identification and so on and so forth. Uh, moreover, doing your PCR uh, amplification uh, or even of marker genes or even PCR um, uh, or PCI amplification of marker genes, uh, chimer chimeric sequence can form. This is when uh, the primers essentially uh, hop from one uh, DNA molecule to another and end up with a, 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 a sequence that's from two different DNA templates. Um, so we'll see a little bit how you can remove chimeric sequences uh, later. So the, the uh, third data quality issue has nothing to do with sequence quality, but with the metadata quality. Uh, this, of course, a lot of these uh, microbiome projects were studying a very complex community. So there's uh, multiple factors affecting the, the microbe host or microbe environment interaction. And often uh, studies don't collect enough data about the environment or about the host. They just collect data about they just collect sequence data. And the, the message here is really you need to also collect data about the environment or about the host to tr really be able to in interpret uh, the metagenomic studies. Okay, so uh, uh, the other issue with metadata is that even if the data are collected, they're often embedded in supplemental files in the publication and they're not really made available together with the sequence data on public repositories uh, and as a result reusing of, of uh, metagenomic study data uh, or microbiome study data so it's it's quite quite a challenge to do. Uh, well, it's it's really it's it's, sing, it's sequencing a single molecule, so the signals from a single molecule is much weaker than uh, the next gen sequencing platforms, which is actually sequencing a bundle of identical fragments to amplify the um, the signal. That's sort of the, the simple explanation. Um, so it's a sig the signal issue. Signal is weaker in these third generation platforms when you only look at one molecule at a time. Um, okay, the next uh, issue has to do with comparability and reproducibility of, of the experiments. Uh, 16S, as I mentioned, you, it's about 1600 base pairs long and and your reads are only about 250 base pair long so you can't sequence the entire 16s gene uh, directly and therefore people focus on different hypervariable regions or v regions and there have uh, studies uh, both from the hmp project and other other groups have shown that different v regions can di can give different res uh, taxonomic results uh, and uh, one of the reasons is that these different V regions actually evolve at different rate as well. Right. So. Uh, we'll, we'll go into this a lot more detail in this in the marker genes section, but the short answer is um, people typically don't compare different V regions. So if you're, let's say there's a, a data set, public data set that you're really interested in, uh, and that's using a specific region, and if you want to compare your result to that data set, then it's best to, to uh, do your analysis based on the reference data available. Um, so that's sort of the, the short answer. Anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah. There are other issues such as uh, you might want to pick a faster evolving region uh, or fast mutating region, I should say, uh, not necessarily fast mutating region if, if you're looking at more closely related organisms. And if you're looking at more distant related organisms, you might want to pick uh, a more slowly mutating region. 
to give you better uh, resolution. Uh, I would just say that the variable region thing is like I would it quite a bit, so people always wonder what's the better variable region. I think just sticking with one is the best approach. Do, yeah, for your own study, definitely. So you'll see little differences, and people always say that they found a new better one, or they made font percent that's better than the other one. Maybe they are better, but there's always little slight biases towards different taxonomic groups. So two approaches is one, you just pick the variable region that everyone else uses, and that's how it's defended. Um, the other approach is maybe you scour the research a bit more and see what the biases are. So if you have particular taxa that you're interested in, if you know something about the environment already, then you could obviously pick a prime percent that's maybe doesn't show us doesn't show that bias, but it's, um, there's no super solution there, so I don't know if you guys have tested the Yeah. Uh, one day we'll be able to sequence the entire 16 years, <laughs> then the debate will be, will be gone. Yeah, you can do that with the pack bio now. Right, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there are some enrichment methods right now when you do on PC, you can look at more than one gene. It's not checked constantly, but they can look at 100 gene regions. Yeah. So to, yeah. Right. Yeah, but the the immediate solution I think is based on what reference data set you want to compare to, and stick to, um, for your own study design, stick to to one marker. So like, in the studies that we're involved in, we looked at multiple markers, and they all give slightly different stories. So for your own sanity, it's probably best to just focus on what the community accepted. Uh, marker is and what and and but be as Morgan said, be aware of the biases that the different markers may have. Do you have any uh, statistical data about uh, different uh, regions, different variable regions about their resolution? Thing? Yeah, so there's there's handful of studies that that do show that, and I also show a plot showing you. Uh, the sort of range of variations within the, the V regions. Okay, uh, and, and there's also studies comparing workflows, of course, comparing the different bioinformatics tools. And again, the, the key message there is that there's always slight variations in these tools and and um, and some and they don't necessarily give you uh, I think that the they they Majority of two will typically give you the, the same story if you look at sort of from a really, uh, you know, from a high level view. But when you try to drill down to more detailed interpretation of your community, the different tools um, can actually give different results. So uh, it's difficult to evaluate tools for microbiome analysis because the ground truth, in other words, what the community really is like, is, is unknown, and that's why you're studying it. So um, people have been using mock communities that they spiked in known uh, organisms, or sometimes they take simulated data, uh, re uh, sequence data to form a simulated community and, and use these to evaluate tools. But again, these are nowhere near uh, the complexity of a true community. And usually um, they're the best tools, that per the, the tool that performs the best in Mark community or simulated data is not necessary and usually not the tool that performed the best when you look at empir em empirical data. So again, it's, it's, it's work in progress, so probably best uh, advice here is to stick with something that's uh, a fairly commonly used tool or standard practice and, and focus on interpretations that you can make and not sort of hit your head against the wall for interpretations that really requires improved improvement in technology to, to be able to, to deal with. So for example, if you're trying to understand strain level variations, that might be a question that's much harder to answer with the current sequencing technology. But if you're just trying to get a sense of the, the uh, difference of at the genus level, at the uh, high, uh, uh, sort of lower taxonomic level, then that's a much easier question to, to address with the technology available. Okay, so uh, because the reads are quite short, uh, short uh, and assembly sometimes creates um, what's called a chimeric sequence or mosaic uh, sequences, uh, it, uh, it's 
difficult to, to understand or to interpret the strain level diversity in metagenomics um, as your uh, assemblers might actually put together uh, fragments from different strains of a, of a same species rather than uh, being able to differentiate different strains uh, when you uh, carry out metagenomics analysis. So that leads to the question, should you assemble metagenomics reads or should you just take individual reads to, uh, and, and do your uh, profiling, do your taxonomy profiling or your functional prediction? And again, this is a highly contested area and uh, it, it's a struggle between longer sequences can give you more information but by assembly the reads, you can create chimeric context consists of DNAs from different non-clonal organisms. Okay, uh, so quick word on what uh, taxonomy versus OTU, uh, and we'll again get into this a little bit more in the, the marker gene analysis. But taxonomy essentially is a label that you give to a group of organisms. Um, and this stems from our humans urge to be able to name something and to be able to classify something. So, um, so uh, sometimes the classification works well. That in, in other words, your label describe the, the group of organisms uh, very well. But in the cases such as E. coli, as you may know, it's a it's a poor label in that there's different kinds of E. coli. Some are pathogenic, some are non-pathogenic. So when you just uh, let's say you found E. coli. Uh, at the um, species level in your sample uh, based on 16 year study, you often uh, cannot interpret whether it's pathogenic or not, right? So, uh, so, so, taxon so be aware that taxonomy essentially is a name given to a group of organism and that group of organism may or may not be um, uh, homo um, homogeneous, so it could, the, the group of organisms could be quite varied. Um, OTUs is sort of an attempt to address this issue. Uh, as evolutionary theory uh, sort of predicts that the more similar sequences uh, are likely to result in more similar functions and in more um, close phy uh, phylo uh, phylogenetic relationship. So OTUs, it's, it's a um, arbitrary in the sense you can define the cutoff arbitrarily, but, but once you define a cutoff, say 97% cutoff, uh, then at least you know the group of organisms in, in that cluster uh, different by um, an average of 97%, uh, uh, sorry, differ by an average of 3% uh, in that group. And again, you don't know functionally if that's a good cutoff or not, so picking cutoff for your uh, OTUs is again somewhat arbitrary and somewhat defined by the community practice rather than, and really when you interpret the results you need to take it with a grain of salt and you might want to actually do cutoffs at different levels and see if your hypothesis still pan out at different levels of cutoff or if, uh, if your results actually change significantly with the cutoff you use. Yes, uh, so to a lower or higher percent cutoff. And typically people would do it um, iteratively, so you cluster at say 97% and if you want to relax it, you can take that and cluster at a lower percentage. And also be aware that that could give you, uh, because of the algorithm used, give you different results than if you just take a sample and cluster at directly at 95%. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that again. So this is just to show that um, the informing OTUs um, by essentially drawing circles in a, a, around a seed sequence. Um, and if you're using an algorithm that's greedy, in other words, first come, first serve, then uh, you could see cases where uh, your sequence um, actually is falls somewhere uh, between two seed sequences, so if if this if this uh, so uh, so sometimes this particular 
uh, sequence could be assigned to this OTU, and sometimes it could be assigned to the, 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 the other OTU. So, uh, um, so that's, that's when uh, you know, changing your cutoffs may make sense. If you have groups that are, uh, if you have communities that are likely to be overlapping, there may be more relaxed cutoff. Uh, that to be more inclusive or in campus in whole community or well, alternatively you might have to make the cutoff more stringent so you minimize situations where you have uh, ambiguous assignments uh, and of course some of them will fall uh, some of the sequences will fall outside of these circles and fall outside of uh, known reference se uh, sequences then you need uh, de novo clustering approaches to to address these outliers. Okay, uh, so uh, I think Morgan will talk more about the f uh, f uh, functional annotation problems when uh, when he talks about metagenomics. Um, but here I'm just highlighting two papers that show you um, the. Uh, uh, so in the first paper, it's a it's a. Uh, Sort of a, a protein functional prediction challenge, where they uh, a group a large group of, of researchers, bioinformatics researchers, take a list a large list of, of uh, genes of unknown functions. So these are sort of hypothetical proteins or hypothetical genes in C in genomic sequences, and then they do functional predictions using tools like BLAST, uh, uh, Sifter and argon and so on to uh, to predict the functions of these uh, sequences and the functions are predicted based on gene ontology terms so that's why they brought, break down into broad categories of, uh, based on molecular functions uh, un, uh, annotation and biological process annotation um, and they wait 11 months or a year and, and then they go back to the literature to see if some of these uh, genes of unknown functions have been studied in the lab and have a, a confirmed function uh, using wet lab studies. So in this uh, particular challenge, they, about 850 genes that was unknown a year ago now has a, a functional uh, uh, a function that's confirmed in 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 a wet lab study. So they then, of course, use that wet lab study, uh, wet lab annotation as the gold standard, and then and then look back on the predicted results. And here it's shown that uh, two um, sort of uh, key points is that it seems that these the, the new generation of tools that are designed specifically for predicting functions of metagenomics data uh, outperform the uh, Generic blast search and trying to use blast uh, hits to assign uh, annotation. So, does everyone know what annotation means? By the way. Well, okay. So, it just means that you provides a description. I'm just loosely using it to it provide a description to a to a uh, to a in this case to a gene. Um, so, anyone else have better <laughs> definition of what annotation is? So the typical usage is that someone, a curator, someone would would uh, look up in, in literature and then uh, make a make a judgment call on what the function of a sequence should be, and then they assign that function uh, to the to the sequence, and that's called the an annotation of that sequence. Again, annotation, in a way, is a label given to that protein, right? So, or to that to that gene. Okay, so the the second uh, moral of the story is that you can see using the F score me measure, which is essentially taking into consideration both um, uh, precision and, and recall. So it's a Average of precision and recall. Uh, the uh, there's still a lot of room for for improvement, and these tools generally are better at uh, 
annotating the molecular functions, in other words, uh, the general functions of the of the protein, rather than uh, the biological process that the given protein or the biological pathway that the given protein is involved. And the reason for that is likely that uh, the different uh, there are different uh, um, tissues or different organs or, or different uh, environmental niche, so on and so forth, and uh, the and while the function, the the biochemical function may be known, the actual biological process that it's involved, uh, it's much harder to to be accurate to to be predicted accurately. So uh, basically, because in other words, homologs or or genes uh, of in the same family can assume different biological roles in different tissues and organs. And so the, the biological process is much harder to, to predict. OK, so I'm actually going to just very quickly go over, or actually show you some of the resources for 16S and for other type of analysis. And again, these are um, uh, things that we will talk in more depth in each of the sections. So for 16S, there's quite a few uh, public databases available. Uh, RTP2, the ribosomal da uh, database project uh, that's been around for a long time. Uh, Silva is a, a, a newer database. The, um, in um, the uh, the Green Gene uh, is another competing uh, database. The main difference, be uh, so both Silva and Green Genes give you pre-aligned. Uh, sequence, uh, pre-aligned um, 16S and, and 18S uh, sequences or templates. And that will allow you to align your own sequences to those databases. And the key difference between Selva and Green Genes is that they have different uh, algorithms to generate the, 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 the alignment template. And there's debate between what, uh, and Selva typically, Selva alignment typically are a lot longer than the Green Gene alignments. Um, and there's debates whether the, uh, the longer sequences give you be better alignments uh, in the, in the trade-off is that you, you need more memory and more disk space to, to, do the, the long, to do the longer alignments uh, versus Green Gene, which has shorter aligned templates. But some people argue, especially uh, people uh, like, uh, uh, like um, Shilas, um, the, the developer mother have is really against Green Gene, saying that it's it doesn't give as good a, a alignment as, as Selva. So mother by default use Selva, and Chime by default use Green Genes. So do those two compete directly, or would you use them in different circumstances? You can use both because you your both mother and Chime would support either databases. So there's no reason you can't. Just try both and see if it give you the same. Yeah. So just to clarify, you said that you said that Chan uses green genes and Silva uses. Um, uh, sorry, mother uses Silva by default. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, they are in competition. Though. I guess. Yeah, I guess they are. But the, both the trees and the practices. You want to so elaborate on that? So, yeah. so a lot of people will say, what are these mother or chime? So popularities in the chime, they don't really have a mother factor. Yeah, they're usually in competition with each other, so that's good. Competition's good, but then they get better. They, they, so I think what we're getting at is they are, in com they are in a way trying to one-up one each other, but as an end user, you're free to use both and try, and then and both mother and chime would be able to to take temp, uh, templates or profiles from both databases. Uh, but if you look at publication coming out of Rob Knight, who's a developer of uh, and and Greg Caparasso's labs, uh, these are the developers of of um, chime versus uh, um, papers coming out of the mother camp. They are often directly commenting each other's results. Uh, so there's definitely competitions going on. Polybeat, of course, there's no, uh, I mean. 
<laughs> no? Well, at, so in Twitter spheres, it's less polite, but in, in publications, usually more, more polite. Yeah? Uh, not on blogs. Not on blogs. No, not on blogs, no, yeah. Uh, uh, what's Pat Schloss, Patrick Schloss's lab in uh, Michigan? Yeah, and he uh, the reason mother is well, I, I, actually I'll save it for when we talk about sixteen A. So. Okay, so uh, here's a list of genomics databases that are available. So this is where you can download reference genomes, uh, and sometimes if your community is well defined with a uh, with known organisms and the reference genomes available, you can actually download the reference genomes uh, and use those uh, for your function uh, for your metagenomics analysis. You'll get into that more, right? Or maybe not. Sorry. Will you talk about reference-based uh, uh, metagenomics analysis? Reference, -based. reference genome based. Uh, trying to yes. Okay, I'm sure Morgan will get into that a bit more. He has to, tonight to prepare anyway. Uh, so, okay, so there's a, also a few handful metagenomics databases, and we will actually, uh, in the tutorial, cover some of these. And lastly, functional databases, and this for sure uh, Morgan will cover uh, tomorrow. Okay, any questions?